welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of The Jump Show. Great to be back alongside Jake and Dan. Uh, how are we both? Jake, come to you, a, a man who no doubt is so excited now. We're just cracking along. It's week after week, isn't it? Top class racing. Of course, this weekend, Jake, Coral Gold Cup, Fighting Fifth, and a few other uh, great races on both undercards. So loads to look forward to. And I imagine you've been scouring the cards as you always have. Absolutely, Tom. And obviously, it'd be remiss not to mention last weekend what a what a weekend's race of, week of racing that was. You know, we, we said it beforehand how good it was going to be. It definitely delivered. That John Durkin was absolutely awesome. I think everybody got excited about that, didn't they? Even even the National Hunt Deltas got excited about that one. So yeah, very good. Uh, this is the best time of year, isn't it? We were just bouncing from good meeting to good meeting every weekend. You know, we've got Tingle Creek next week. December meeting after that like everything is just week after week up until Christmas so we absolutely love that here on the jump show 150 likes would be fantastic this week and uh, we got it last week it's always great so please do click that like button if you haven't yet subscribed to us uh, we'd also love that because it really does help us out so um get clicking on that mouse and talking of JP McManus uh, a recent notable performance is a, a segment we do each week. We're going to start with that. And Jake, I know that you're looking at a horse in those famous greed, greed, green and gold hoops. Freudian slip, well, I've a, heard one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. He is a bit greedy with all his chases that he's got at the minute, isn't he? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to the graduation chase at Haydock on Saturday. Obviously, we've already mentioned what a great card it was. Really exciting. Uh, the ground obviously turned out quite testing, didn't it? That caught a lot of horses out, but that did not catch out Trelawne and Iroko, who had a great battle um, out in the front. Obviously, Trelawne was there um, returning to action after a long absence. He was a horse that I would have been a massive fan of for the Coral Gold Cup this week, uh, had he gone off his mark of 144. He ended up going to the graduation chase and, you know, he really was there to win. Um, he, you know, his, he bounced into every fence Came out of them well. Tom Bellamy, you know, drove him out all the way to the line to, to, to score. Um, he's gone up to a mark of 152, which I think makes life quite tough for him going forward. But Oroko has been left on his mark of 152. And he was just giving a really sneaky ride, wasn't he? Like, John Joe O'Neill really did just smuggle him into the race. Never really asked too many questions until he needed to. Um, jumped the last. It looked like he probably would have got there. But, you know, Trelon w- w- was definitely trying the harder of the two, I think it's fair to say. And yeah, it was job done for Oroko. Connections had said before the race that they, you know, the, the Grand National is the ultimate aim. JP would love to have a runner in it. And, and this is obviously his nominated target. Um, I think he, he's going to have a season now mapped around that. That's absolutely clear. But I, I was pleasantly surprised to see after the race, he's actually still rate, uh, still a, a priced up at 25 to 1. I think that's, that's a very fair price for a horse that we know is going to be campaigned to that race. He's going to go to the Cotswolds chase next. They're going to give him a spin over hurdles after that. And then he's going to go to Waintree. So I think that's his season mapped out. He's currently got a mark of 152. I can't see that changing too much between now and, and now and Aintree. And yeah, I think I think he's a horse who's going to relish the Grand National trip and, and the Grand National fences as well. Yeah, you could well be right, I think. Um, I also think Trelawne is really, really good, actually. And yeah. that graduation chase looks strong and the front two were miles clear of the rest and they look proper classy performers don't they so i think yeah two two definitely to follow for the rest of the season um more than two to follow comes from dan because i know that he's got a fair few notable performances from the last week yeah and they're all pretty high profile all coming from ireland so i'll, I'll go for them fairly quickly uh, the first one's gonna be nurbird ring uh, second chase start second very eye-catching one finished third in the craddock's town staying on under tender enough handling Obviously, Galway hurdle winner. We know he was a high-class juvenile in a year full of very good juveniles. He's looking like he's a bit of a handicap project. It wouldn't surprise me if that two-mile handicap at the DRF is on the agenda. Joseph won it with a wave of the sea. When he was a five-year-old, I think that's very possible. Obviously, he would need one more run to get a mark. But I think he has to go in your tracker for a handicap down the line. A second one is Vanillier, who obviously a familiar name to many people. Made his cross-country debut at Punchestown. Obviously, Yard won it with Stumptown. He was back in sixth. Look, he's always been a bit of a sticky jumper. I think he, he jumped okay on his first attempt. Punchestown's quite a hard cross-country track. He was safe enough, a bit slow at times. It improved for the experience, as Stumptown did. They've said after a couple of seasons of gearing his campaigns around the Grand National that they're not going to necessarily do that this year. They've talked about the cross-country in March being a target. I think they're going to go to the December version of the race. I wouldn't expect him to win that. I expect him to get some experience. He's currently 33-1 to for the cross-country in March, and now that's a handicap. 
I think he's the type who could well improve for that. He's off a mark in the mid-140s in Ireland. We know he's got plenty of back class. I think he'd be an interesting one now that race is a handicap. And then the third one is Son of Anarchy. Came with a massive reputation after he beat Jazz Decott, who won the bumper on Scottish Grand National Day. Beat him by 15 lengths. The world seemingly was his oyster as he made his debut in a two-mile five main hurdle. And a strong-looking one at that. Notably weak in the betting there. I thought he'd be pretty sure. He drifted pretty much continuously throughout the day. Tanked into the race. Went really well through it. Hit the front when the other JP horse kind of stopped to nothing, found himself in front and Jen just weakened out of it, looking like a horse who needed the run. I think he'll improve massively for that. And it's still hard to forget the style of his point to point win and the reputation he came with. He's been pushed out to 100 to 1 in a place for the Albert Bartlett. Now, he was very much shorter than that beforehand. It wouldn't surprise me at all if this is a horse who goes on to look very impressive in a maiden hurdle next time out. Maybe goes a bit more of the lesser trodden path route, maybe sort of grade three after that, but wouldn't surprise me at all he ends up being uh, in those grade one novice hurdles. And for as much as the Bartlett can be a lottery, 100 to 1, yeah, well, probably worth a few quid if you can get on, I'd say. Yeah, good arguments made there, Dan. Uh, Son of Anarchy, of course, named after, I assume, the the motorcycle show sons of anarchy and no doubt you'll be hoping that he's as as quick as one of those yamahas that's for sure uh going forward <laughs> jesus <laughs> oh that actually that's you not know i will admit that was really bad um <laughs> finally <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't need to admit it but that really was terrible um i'm gonna i'm gonna uh chuck one in here uh what johnny who finished third in the potential qualifier last week at uh, market raisin oh well, this week actually and um I thought it was a decent enough race. Skyjack Hijack came out of it in the morning, which is a big shame. Uh, but I think it still produced a decent race with a couple of horses who fought at the finish being sort of the ones you'd hope they would be like. Supreme Gift won it. Harbour Lake was back in second. Then Motta Johnny was a very close third. Uh, he was held up off the pace by Sean Bowen. I have to say, I thought coming to the last, uh, he was going to loom up and go by, but actually ended up finishing third. Supreme Gift on the far side, Showed a little bit more willingness, I thought, than Harbour Lake actually eventually finished second. So uh, a bit of a shame what the Johnny couldn't go by either of them. And interestingly enough, um, Dan said to me and Jake afterwards that he thought potentially the horse could use some headgear. And I think that's a, that's a very fair shout, actually, because I think off our, Mark, he's currently off 118. He's definitely better than that. I'm not, I'm not being funny. Like, he is well handicapped off that. I think he'll probably be aimed at another tennis qualifier somewhere down the, the, the near future. And if there is headgear employed... I don't know whether they're going to try and get up to sort of the ratings band of the potents and get him into the bottom of the weight or something eventually. Uh, that would be a, a pretty decent aim, I think, to have with him because I think he is talented. Um, and I don't think he put it all together in that race, but there was plenty to like. And of course, he's really unexposed over the trip. That was the first time really we've seen him over two miles, seven plus. And I think Sean Bowen almost rode him to get it in a way to see if he'd get it uh, at the back. And um, although he didn't quite finish off the race, there's no doubt in my mind that he got the trip. Um, I think it's just a case of putting his head down and, and getting stuck in. So I think Dan's suggestion of headgear is a good one. Uh, let's move on to this week, then, because it's a, a bit of a smorgasbord of, of class. And we've got the uh, Coral Garcop at Newbury, uh, a two-day meeting there. We're going to start by looking at Friday, aren't we? Uh, the John Frank and Novice Chase, grade two, over two and a half miles. And at the moment, the market leader is Captain Teague, uh, who is uh, not actually really seen a rival yet because he was a he walked over the rest of them uh, when everything was pulled out last time. So uh, we're going in there with a bit of an unknown quantity in, in Captain Teague of offences. Uh, that said, he is at the head of the betting. Uh, the jukebox man is second in. We've got Johnny Who, who um... <laughs> I just think with him, I think he just likes winning at Carlisle on the bridle and then won't do anything the rest of the season. <laughs> but that, that, that's just me. <laughs> Um, and then we've got Masaccio, Boomborn and uh, Buggy Seagull. So uh, a small field, but quite a good, quite a good one, I have to say. Uh, Dan, I'll come, I'll come to you, your first thoughts on this race. Um, Captain Teague at the top of the market, what do you reckon? Well, I'm just very much looking forward to the end of the jokes around Captain Teague being so impressive on his chase debut. It'll be, a, it'll be a good day when I don't have to hear another pun about that. Look, this is an awfully tricky race. I definitely won't be having a bet in it. Obviously, on, they all have previous shallow hurdle form. Obviously, Captain Teague won that race. I do think Newbury's a track that will suit him. He's a bit of an awkward galloping type, but I think he's an out-and-out -out stayer. I think he's got a bit of speed, but I think he just needs a big galloping track. I think Newbury will very much suit him. Obviously, Johnny Who was very impressive on his chasing debut. John Joe and Little Horse, Johnny Who in particular, can they actually just back it up? Saw Springwell Bay didn't really do so. Johnny Who has a history of not going on. I'd If he, if he could 
put that together and it almost improve a bit. I think you take a lot of beating here because he was really good at Carlisle, but it's just so hard to trust that he will. I won't have a bet in the race. See, the jukebox man is respected. I'd probably go forward on him. He's an interesting prospect. Had a couple of really tough races towards the end of last season. So hopefully that hasn't taken the life out of him. Difficult race. Probably between the top three on class, I would say. Bugsy Siegel may be a bit of a handicap project down the line. I'd probably be looking for him, but good race. Tricky one. I know I won't be having a bet in it. Yeah, good pronunciation of Bugsy Siegel, actually. I forgot it was like that. So, well done, Dan. Um, go on, Jake. What do you reckon? I think it's I think it's a decent race. Um, my fancy in it is Masaccio, but I'll come on to that in a second. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'd be with Captain T here, I think. Um, obviously, he proved he was the best over hurdles of these in the Chalo, where the Duke Man was third. Johnny Hill was fourth. Masaccio was fifth. Obviously, he's now got to prove that he can be the best of these over fences. Obviously, it's very annoying that the extra race was a was a walkover, not for the fact that he would have had any competition had it gone ahead, because the horse that he was left to run against was, I think, I don't know, 100 to 1 or something like that. He was 50 to 1 on anyway. Um, so, you know, he clearly would have won. It just would have been nice to see how he jumped his fences. But he's done plenty of schooling, for, obviously, for that race. He's now obviously done his schooling for this race as well. So I wouldn't be too concerned. He was also the pick of the Paul Nichols bunch because Caldwell Potter was also entered here. And he's going to Carlisle instead because they didn't think he was quite up to scratch with his jumping um, for a first time out test in a grade two. But obviously, you know, Paul's done this last year with Hermes Allen. I think Hermes Allen was probably a fairly similar type of horse to Captain T. Um, I think Captain T has got a lot of class. I think two and a half miles is probably his trip. Obviously, he went to the Bartlett like the rest of them and he was the one who, who you know, fell shortest of all. But I I, I wouldn't see him as, as an out and out stayer like, like some of the others are. I think Johnny who probably is an out and out stayer eventually. Um, as I said, as Dan said, obviously he was very good at Carlisle, but will he back that up? Does he need a bit further? We will find out. But yeah, no, Captain Teague, I thought five to two was very fair and I'll, I'll be happy to play that. Okay, good stuff, Jake. Um, yeah, I'll move on quickly because I've only got a small word on Masaccio. I, I think he's just quite solid because he's been to Newbury of offences. He's done it well. Uh, I was quite impressed by that first time of offences. does seem to me as though this season, I know he's done it before, but this season in particular, Alan King's first time as over fences is jumping really well in Novice Company. He seems to have schooled them excellently and they all know their job. Uh, we talked about Helen Vane the other day, didn't we, on first time. I know he got beat, but he jumped really well. And um, I just think he brings quite a solid angle to the race. He might not have the class of a Captain Teague, but you never know. Fences might have improved them a bit and he certainly looked like a he was in good order on his return. So I'm looking forward to seeing him again. He's got a bit to find at the ratings with the rest of them, but I do think he's quite solid having had that run behind him. Uh, but we shall see. It's a, it's a cracking little race. Uh, not quite so cracking as the 305, the Coral Long Distance Hurdle, just the four runners. Bit of a shame, really, uh, that Cranbo wasn't declared. Um, but we've got Strong Leader, Langer Dan, Montmorel, and Flight Deck. Got to say, I'm looking forward to seeing Strong Leader back, Jake. Yeah, me too. Um, I think it's the most likely winner, obviously, the odds tell you that. I think it would be a decent race between him and Langadan if we knew 100% that Langadan was A, trying, B, fit, C, could jump, D, could move a leg. Um, every time Dan Skelton talks about him, he just puts you off and off and off him, doesn't he? So it's just so hard. to. to if, if you were backing Langadan here, I think you, you'd be making the case purely on his ability that he showed in the, in the back end of the spring there, you know, the sound down race, etc., if he if he if he ran like that, he would obviously have a good chance here. But will he run like that? It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> That's for sure. So uh, we'll find out with him. But yeah, strong leader obviously has got the solid form. He won the Grade One at Aintree. This should hopefully be a season where he starts to kick on. This looks like an ideal opportunity for him, and he'll take the beating. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, it does seem as though whenever Dan Skelton is now asked about Langadan, he just kind of laughs because yeah, I mean, what, what else is there to say, really? I mean. He clearly does have his issues in training. At least that's what we're led to believe, isn't it? He's obviously a, a bit of a tricky customer. And my opinion on him is that he's just better in the spring. Uh, Dan, what do you make of the race in Langadan? Oh, don't ask me about Langadan. I don't want to ever speak, speak about that horse in detail. My, <laughs> the horse I le like the least in training by a country mile. Uh, him winning that second Coral Cup was one of the darkest race course experiences I've ever endured uh, and he's just a bit of an enigma uh, and realistically I'm not surprised to see him drifting I think the early price has had strong leader about 10 to 11 Langadan 13 to 8 I think strong leader's been pretty solid Langadan's drifting all the while I expect that trend to continue and strong leader's probably going to go off shorter however I'm going to do something a bit weird in this and I will be dutching the two outsiders because I think both of the front two have their quirks and have their issues Langadan I couldn't touch with a barge pole for multiple reasons as Jacob outlined in that lovely monologue about him having about five or six things to prove 
And strong <laughs> leader has never been no straightforward horse. I know it's obviously a grade one, everyone's remembering the grade one at Aintree. But before that, this is also absolutely threw away the Ascot hurdle. Maybe he wants to go left-handed. I do think Newbury will suit him because it's not too dissimilar to Aintree in its style. But he's tricky. He's had cheap pieces on it when he went to Cheltenham and looked very awkward. He's not guaranteed to be an absolute good thing. I mean, he should win this if they've got any ambition of going on to be a proper staying hurdler. But I, I don't really have any appeal of backing him a short price for much he is probably the standout. So Mon Morale is getting a bit shorter. He's now into six to one. Obviously, very good juvenile. It never really happened for him thereafter because he was in two mile grade rate one races. Then he went over the fences, which he hated. Only started to really click towards the back end of last season where he won the attempts. Had a blowout run recently where it was just very much getting the cobwebs away. The blinkers that he wore for when he won the attempts are now back on after being off. Still has scoped, I think, as a three mile hurdler. And again, he has race fitness on his side. I don't think Paul Nichols is really going to be trying to hide anything. I think they're just going to try and win what they can. So I've seen some say maybe looking to go back to the Potence. I think that was a, a bit of a one trick and a shot to nothing. I don't think that's going to gam- gear his campaign entirely around that. And to be honest, I think this is very winnable. And then you have Flight Deck in here, who on figures, if you were to believe handicap ratings, has absolutely no chance. But I said a, a couple of weeks ago in, when we were previewing, I think it might have been the Badger Beers, that I think handicap ratings definitely have their place. But there are some races where... It's about what horse is ready to run their race in the conditions. And Flight Deck will run his race because we know what he's going to do. And it's not often you get a 33 to 1 outsider of four who is the front runner. Normally they're held up at the back and never actually get involved in the race. But Flight Deck's had a spin round. I can catch him, Derry, when we last saw him over two mile five. Ran well. We know how he's going to go from the front. And obviously, he was only beaten two lengths in this last year behind Paisley Park and Dashiell Drasher. Obviously, getting on. But Paisley Park backed that form up time after time. He finished ahead of Strong Leader giving him six pounds at Cheltenham in January. And it, if you go back to last year's race, Flight Deck didn't even get the run of it. Normally he goes from the front and takes a bit of catching. Didn't actually ever get to the front in the race last year. There was another horse who took him on and could never really get his own way, but will definitely have his own way here. Like Mon Morale, blinkers go back on when they were off last time out. I do think in a small field like this, you'll find worse 33 to one shots because he will just be out in front. He's there to be shot at. And if one of the top two are on their game, They'll breeze past him. It won't be an issue. But I don't think there's a guarantee they will be. So I'm going to dutch the, front, or the bottom two in the market, and I'm also going to play a bit of the small reverse forecast. Nothing big stakes, but I don't really like either of the front two at short odds. So I think you can make a case for Monmorel and Flight Deck. And hopefully someone is thinking I'm not just talking complete nonsense out there, although I imagine most probably will think it's complete nonsense. But there, there you go. <laughs> I mean, This is the issue, really, because... I looked at the race and I complete uh, immediately just discounted flight deck, and then I hear your argument, and I'm thinking, oh, all right then, that's the problem. It's not. It's it, yeah. It's and look, it's going to require underperformance, but obviously that's factored in. And thirty thirty one in the four runner race, only narrowly beaten in it last year, is fit, has the blinkers back on, will go from the front. You'll find a lot worse thirty three to one shots out there. I think. Love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, arguably love that more than we've any race we've done recently. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> Over to you for the rest of Friday. Uh, lots going on, isn't there, around the country? Anything else you like? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. I'm going to stick to Newbury for my anything else this week, um, or for, for Friday anyway. And we're going to start off with the 12.45, the two-mile. And obviously, it's handicap chase. Obviously, Kalista de Berle is in here as the short price favourite. He's kind of making the market, really, because everything else is, is, is big prices. Uh, one of mine is in here. My handicap is to follow personal ambition. Uh, he's off the mark of 131, which remained unchanged after a second behind Lookaway because that was in a novice chase, so they couldn't change his mark. Uh, Lookaway's like rated 137 or something like that. So he looks like to be to be decently treated, and he's currently 8 to 1. And I don't really see that lasting, per se, but if he does, I'll be backing him each way as kind of like an each-way bet to nothing. And I'll probably look at the, the market without Khalif Dabali as well because I think that he's probably the best of the rest. So... I'll have a look at those two markets. Uh, personal ambition, I think, would be a decent bet there. Obviously, Khalif Dabali would be hard to beat just purely for the fact that he jumped so well before falling on his debut. Um, in the 120, we've got Miss Altia Blue for Paul Nichols. Um, now, on her penultimate start at Ortoy, she beat Mercia, who has won a listed race since and is now with Paul Nichols. Uh, sorry, now with Willie Mullins for Kenny Alexander. Um, she looks like a pr- very promising horse if Miss Altia Blue has you know, similar type of ability. I think she's going to love this softer ground compared to the James Owens, you know, types in here. I think they'd probably want it a bit quicker coming off the flat. Um, so I think that she could make the most of that. And then in the 230, probably my 
best bet of the day, I'd say, actually, is Gallup de Chasse for Venetia Williams. Obviously, she's in absolutely flying form after last weekend. But my um, my argument for Gallup de Chasse, you know, extends much further than that. Uh, he had a very long absence be before returning at Weatherby last month. And it was a really good effort, actually, because, you know, despite the absence, he, he you know, travelled up really nicely on the inside running rail, leaving the back. Looked like he was going to win the race. And then he just took a bit of a blow. Obviously, Genoa just tracked him the whole way down the straight. Never had a chance of winning, but it was a good second. Definitely took a blow. Would definitely come on for it. And on his penultimate start before his long absence, he was at Newbury over course and distance where he beat Kandu Kid by a neck. And obviously, Kandu Kid is rated 145 now and is, you know, fairly well fancied for the Coral Gold Cup, it's, uh, Coral Gold Cup itself. So, yeah, they, they would be my three for the day. And, you know, fingers crossed we've got a couple of winners in there. OK, thanks very much indeed for that, Jake. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cracking undercard. You just alluded to a Newbury. Yeah, some really good race. I love that 1245 as well. Uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on ID Wood. I don't think it's been quite good enough to win, but um, I'm hoping he goes close. It could be one of the, the the ones towards the four in the in the terms of the pace. Uh, Dan, what do you fancy on Friday? Uh, yeah, just a couple. So the two thirty that uh, Jake's already mentioned, Gallup de Chasse, definitely can see the case for him. And but another horse in here who's beat Candu Kid at Newbury and absolutely loves <laughs> Newbury is a horse I adore called Heltonham, who I'm so glad they're not running in the Coral Gold Cup because there's not a chance in hell that horse stays three mile two. Not a chance, because he has not a slow horse. I mean, they ran him in the red rum towards the back end of last season because they thought he had plenty of pace, but he's a horse of two, two and a half miles, two mile six, an absolute push, big galloping tracks, loves Newbury's three from free here. So he also beat Kandu Kid on his most recent visit to Newbury, obviously, who's gone on to frank that form. Plenty of pace angles in this race as well, which is really key for him because he's a hold-up horse. He'll come from off the pace, and he's such a strong traveling type. I'd be really strong on him if they had a run into him and they entered him up a few times and the ground got too quick for him and they didn't run him. He did go to the Gallops Day at Newbury. So I think he'll be forward enough. And I was looking at the calendar to see, are there any other really decent prizes that they could almost just be using this as a springboard to around tracks like Newbury? And I couldn't really find one. So I'm hoping they're going to have him as far forward as possible and he's got his ideal conditions here. So I love Helton. I think he's around four to one. I think that's more than fair for a, a course and distance specialist. And then in the 340, really open, winnable race, I think. And Hamino AA is currently 7-1. to one. I think that's very fair. Still very unexposed as a staying hurdler. Chasing didn't work out last season. But he was second in a grade 3 handicap at Sandown. And then he was third over course and distance when last seen. Look at the form of that. Looks pretty strong with the front three. Only separated by a short neck there. Mm -hmm. Zay Knights won it. He won his next two. He's now 16 pounds higher. Take no chances was second. Won her next two. Now won a listed race. 21 pounds higher. Makes a four pound rise for Hermino. Look pretty modest, to be honest. I'd say this race looks wide open to me. I think seven to one each way is a very good bet. Okay. I uh, love the sound of both those, uh, Dan, I have to say. I'm going to go to the 120. Uh, looking forward to this juvenile Phillies race. It's a listed contest. I like Ambient Amigo for the James Owen team. Rated 95 on the flat. Took her ages to get the hang of it over hurdles in her debut. But she did inside the sort of last 100 yards, and she just went whoosh. Her flat speed really came to the fore. Uh, she'll need to learn plenty more to win this tougher race, but... She's got that flat class. We know what James Owen can do with this type of the Gredley. He's done so well, hasn't he, so far? Um, but she looked like she was learning on the job. She's got a proper turn of foot, though, proper engine. And I think this uh, this track will suit her. She can just be smuggled into it and then be produced and just fly. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Uh, she's currently second favourite behind Miss Altair Blue. <laughs> Next up, we're going to go Saturday, uh, Newbury on Saturday. 154 is the Coral Daily Reward Shaker Handicap for the class 2 North 245. Very, very competitive fare, it has to be said. It looks a cracker and post toi at the top of the market for now. Uh, go on, Dan, you start. Yeah, as you say, this is a pretty tricky race, I thought. I think there's a few in here, like in post toi in the waterside, who have a, a fair enough ceiling, I'd say. They've got plenty of potential to be better. Uh, I think you can make reasons why neither of them will be at their best here. I thought Isam was the solid each-way option. It seems like we've tried to get him into a race now for the last three weeks, and he's ducked and dived and not reappeared. But so he ran really well in the Welsh Champion Hurdle when we last saw him. Obviously, that was over two miles, decent ground, never going to be his forte. He's a two-and-a-half-mile soft ground horse, which will get here. See, Steel Ally went on to frank that form recently. See, the Wincanton form, his last win, would suggest that a four-pound rise isn't beyond him. Now, I don't think he has the potential that some of these have in here. So he's very much a kind of a modest each-way option. But 
I think bearing in mind he's had the run, they've clearly been le- looking at a race like this for a while, stepping back up in trip. I think he'll run his race. There could be one or two that are just far too ahead of the handicapper, but I think he's pretty much guaranteed to give a good account of himself. Okay, good stuff. Dan, Jake, what do you think about the race? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at the front two in the market, then I had I would have a preference towards in the water side because I think Impose Trois is kind of a questionable stayer at this trip. When he went into the Lanzarote, that was on good to soft ground and he really didn't seem to get home that day. So that would be my concern with him. In the water side, obviously, was a was an animal who just absolutely tanked around everywhere he went last year, wasn't he? Probably too hard on himself. He's had the wind up. That'll be interesting to see if that has sorted it all out. My only issue with him is that I think they're going over fences with him, and or at least that was the original plan. Mm-hmm. And you know there was always this thing of maybe he'll go for a handicap hurdle first, but surely if they are, then he won't be fully ready, and you know fences will be where he is at his best next time. So I'd be happy to to leave them if you if you maybe choose between the pair, then it would be in the water side. But like like down, I, I thought that Sam was a really nice each way bet here. Um, a lot of Tom Sims are coming on for the first run of the season as well. Like you said, two winners this week, and both of them have had, had a run beforehand, which wasn't anywhere near as good, obviously, as, as their win. Um, but yeah, Issam was very eye-catching, went fourth in, in that Welsh champion hurdle, which is a trip way too short. Steps back up in trip here. Loves the soft ground. I think there's a lot to like about him. Okay, interesting interesting take on the race from you, Jake. Um, I'm going to just throw one in there at a big price, actually. Uh, who I think might run a good race if she's declared that spring note, who is currently three from three in Newbury. And although they came in weaker races and against her own sex, um, I think she's got bags of potential to go on. She's quite a lightly raced for a six-year-old. And uh, her disappointing effort came uh, at the back end of last season at Cheltenham. Well, I don't think really conditions were in her favour. She doesn't really want good ground. She wants soft ground. She gets that. And given that course record, if she's ready to go, I think she could run a, a decent race. Okay, boys, on to the next one. It's the 225. It's the uh, Jerry Fielden, or should I say the Coral Racing Club Intermediate Handicap Hurdle, as it is currently known. Right, Jake, what do we make of this one? I mean, Jericho de Repine heading the market. Two efforts recently, or at least his last two efforts, have been pulled up, pulled up. What do you make of him? I think that he has a very good chance here, to be honest. Um, I'm willing to put a line through whatever ha- the hell happened at Sandown 20 days ago. Obviously, he went missing, ended up getting to the post, jumped like, I don't know what, just, just completely soared over them like they were two, like double fences. Um, I, I, I don't know. Something was clearly wrong with him that day. It, Nicky Henderson you know, completely said it's not him. I, I can subscribe to that and put a line through it. I think the Supreme, again, it was just a, a race that was probably too good for him. But this type of race, often like of 135, if you look back to that grade two Rossington main form where he beat Lump Sum and Fiercely Proud, obviously Lump Sum's now 143, Fiercely Proud's 128, probably has potential to be better than that as well. Like At the time, that was a really disappointing performance. I remember being there on, I think it was Trials Day, wasn't it, that they ran the same day. And I remember, yeah. you know, it was quite a disappointing performance at the time. Everyone was thinking, oh, we hoped he'd be a superstar and he's only beaten Lump Sum by three quarters of a length or whatever it was. But looking back on that now, that that's a really nice piece of form in the context of being rated 135 in a handicap. So I'd definitely be having a play on him. I think a, a bit of an each way price salver is, is interesting. I think we probably mentioned him every week for the last four weeks waiting for this soft ground. He finally, finally will get the soft ground, hopefully, but, <laughs> unless there's just a, a massive sunstorm between now and then. But yeah, if, if he runs, I thought he was interesting. Um, I think the, my only real concern with him, though, is he's a four-year-old who doesn't get any sort of allowance carrying top weight, and they, they haven't claimed off him. I thought if they claimed off him, I'd have been all over him as, a, as an each-way angle. I think that he'd have a great chance. Off a mark of 143, obviously, it, it is tough for him as a four-year-old. But um, yeah, I think I think he's another nice horse. And then last, I just I would just have concerns over the ground on Queen's Gamble. I, I've seen a few people put, put her up now, but all her all her form is on good ground. I would have slight concerns that if she if she's really going to see it out on that type of ground, but yeah, it's an interesting race, and, and you can make ang- you know angles for quite a few of these. Yeah, you can actually. I was quite amused to see Johnny Burke's face completely light up at uh, Taunton today because uh, he was asked about riding Queen's Gamble, and he clearly can't wait to get back on her. Uh, the one before I go for Dan, the one that I think could run a decent race actually at a price uh, down the bottom of the weights is the famous five for the informed Venetia Williams team. Uh, coming into this on a hat trick that hasn't been seen for quite some time, but we know that race fitness probably won't be an issue with the Williams teams uh, team. It never is. And um, ground is very much in the famous fives favor. So uh, I'd be keen at that one at a decent price uh, down the bottom of the weights, uh, obviously a lot lower rated than some of these, but uh, you can see that 
it's got the profile of a horse you could easily go on again this year. So I'd be interested in that one around about 12, uh, 10 to 1. Dan, what about you for Jerry Fielding? I think we need to touch on the ground because I think a lot of people may look at the description and see, obviously, it's soft currently on the hurdles track, soft, good to soft in place on the chase, and there's no rain forecast. So thinking, well, we're probably talking a lot about soft ground. People thinking, well, well it's going to dry out to decent ground, isn't it? The going stick readings are so low. Like, they're not st- traditional good to soft, even soft. You'd be looking on, on those going stick numbers more heavy than you would soft, to be honest. So I think that's how I think we've all looked at it, really. And while it might dry out slightly, I still think it's going to be testing ground. I don't see how it won't be, to be honest. So th- for anyone who may be questioning that in terms of our reasoning, I think that's where we're coming from. Obviously, we will we'll know more on Friday once they start running on it, but I can't see a world in which it's going to be quick. I think it's going to be pretty testing. Uh, so that would be a concern for Queen's, for Queen's Gamble, who I would have really fancied to say if the ground was definitely gone the good to soft side. And again, if it does look like it's riding quicker, I think she has to come into it. Really tricky race again, and you give it a, a good chance to a few of these. But I would reluctantly give Jericho the Rep and eight another chance. I just, I was praying that he would stay over hurdles anyway this season because I thought that Mark 135 was tailor made for a big two mile handicap. I was hoping they'd go to the Greatwood. Ideally, I mean, that turned out to be quite a, a deep, decent race. But I think he would have been there or thereabouts because he's clearly better than a Mark 135. You can forgive the runner supreme. He was almost a guinea pig for the Nicky Henderson team, wasn't he? The, the yard were clearly under a cloud. He was the first run to, to have a run. He didn't run well at all. And that's when the rest started pulling out. So I think he was can easily forgive him that. Chase Davey was anomaly. They've recently had him out of the course just to almost give him a new experience. That it was all going to be okay. All seemingly went well there. Obviously, one, two races here. Let's say that Rossi to Maine didn't look impressive, but neither did John Bon, remember? Like, he looked very workmanlike when he won the Rossi to Maine. I think, generally speaking, the Kenderson novice hurdlers who go into that sort of January, early February period with an eye on March aren't fully ready. They're kind of just getting there. And I think that was very much true of Jer- Jericho de Repine. He's got to be better than Mark 135. It's price of 92 right now. That's the minimum that I'd want. I'd, I'd be curious to see if he gets well supported. Because I say, this is a deep race, but at 92 minimum, I will give Jericho the Repine another chance. Okay, excellent stuff. Uh, quite a big shout there for Jericho from both uh, Jake and Dan. Uh, let's move on to the big one, shall we? The Coral Gold Cup on Saturday. A rich history. Wouldn't be the richest of tapestries, though, for this race this year. But it's still very competitive, that's for sure. Um, before I come to either of you lads, I'm going to uh just mention my horse to follow from last year uh who is colonel harry and he ran pretty well on occasion last year didn't get that grade one victory which i was disappointed about but he got very close to doing it uh only a length and a quarter behind le patron at sandown can't believe he didn't win that race um anyway <laughs> uh he did then he then he then beat trelawn so that form has worked out well i know trelawn jumped halfway across north yorkshire at uh Weatherby that day, but he still beat him. Um, no, he's look, he looks exactly the right profile for the race. Jamie Snowden won it last year with that's right, Gino in the same colours, same jockey, a horse stepping up in trip, and a horse who got a very similar profile. Um second on reappearance for Colonel Harry at Carlisle. I thought it was more than fine. Uh, Marvel Sands was ready and raring to go. I think Colonel Harry needed it a bit. Marvel Sands should look fitter, sped past him in the, in the latter part of the race. Colonel Harry's going to strip much fitter now. And um, for all the world, Jamie Snowden seems to think that he's going to be absolutely fine over 3 2. 148 is a very fair mark and a second season chaser. He'll do for me, uh, Colonel Harry, I have to say. Right, who should I come to? Uh, Jake, what do you think? Yeah, I can completely see the angle of Colonel Harry. I and mean, he was probably the first horse I looked at for the race. Obviously, you. It's a shame it's cut up as badly as it has. 14 bullets is just not good enough for a for a Coral Gold Cup, unfortunately. But that's where we are. Um, yeah, so he, he was the first type horse I looked at. But I was also looking back on my record in the race. I was having a conversation with Dan about it. And I, my record in this race is, is atrocious. It's it's so bad. Um, I always go for the sexy novice who's, you know, the second, sexy second even novice who, who's got that really nice profile. He's got a nice mark. But they just never seem to be battle hardened enough for for a race like this. Obviously, l- last year uh, that's right, Gino ended up being good enough. But that was my only concern with Harry: is will he stay the trip? Obviously, connections seem to think he will, but they're, they're not going to say he's not, are they? Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> so yeah, l- 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 I think that I- I'm going to change my approach a bit. He's not a horse that I've ever really got on side, but I'm going to get him on side for this time, and, and hopefully he runs a big one because he's a battle hardened absolute machine who who just loves the game and that's Broadway boy Dan's favorite Broadway boy I'm gonna have him on side here I think he's he's the type of horse that you want for a race like this I think he, he's a proper battler 
obviously last year he went to Cheltenham um, for uh, in the December meeting for the three mile two furlong premier handicap chase, which he won off a mark of 146. He showed a very good attitude that day to win. I think after that, connections just as they do, think he's absolute top class. You think he's the dog bollocks, running all the big races. Didn't really go to plan. Obviously, the, the Warwick race was disappointing. <clears throat> I can forgive the Aintree race because it was a long, hard season, considering how aggressively he was campaigned in the autumn. You know, three races at Cheltenham, back to back to back in October, November and December, running really well in all three. I think that his, his return at Cheltenham is very interesting because obviously he went off favourite. Connections kind of were saying before the race that, you know, he, he'll be absolutely fine for this. Finished third, got in a bit of a battle for the lead, obviously, but does he know that day? Ended up being, you know, quite far behind Senior Chief, who, uh, amazingly, is going to be £10 worse off, though, <clears throat> which would completely put me off Senior Chief straight away. After the race now, they're kind of saying that he took a big blow, and that's what's really interesting to me, because if he did take a blow, he did need the run, then I think that he's got a race in him. I think he's got one more big one. I wouldn't be a horse, he wouldn't be a horse that I'm going to be, you know, itching to take going forward. I think that, you know, this is this is his moment. This is his time to shine. I think that he's gone to the well a fair few times, but hopefully this will be one last big one. Off a mark of 148, he's only two pounds higher than his last winning mark. Sam Twist and Davey's going to be giving him absolutely everything. I think he's the exact type of horse you need. And yeah, I, I'm going to be with Broadway Boy for this. I like the fact Dan is just sitting there smirking. <laughs> it's, it's almost just like I'm borderline sighing because... Oh, see, I love the horse. I love him so much. But I just, I had the concern going into Cheltenham when we discussed it then. Have they just bottomed this horse out? And there were so many issues going on towards the back of the last season. Obviously, Warwick was poor. Then he had ulcers, apparently. Then he was fine. Then he missed Cheltenham because he scoped badly. Then he reappears at Aintree with cheek pieces on. Ever a horse who didn't need cheek pieces, it's Broadway boy, ran averagely at best. And then, as Jake mentioned, going into Cheltenham, there was a hundred grand handicap. Let's not forget that was not a Mickey Mouse or less of a spin round type of race. They gave him the classic aggressive, give it everything right from the front again, and he just kind of faded out of it pretty moderately in the end. And again, before the race, yeah, he's ready. Yeah, he's, he's going to win after the race. Yeah, really, will come on for that. Wasn't ready at all. You know. So what? What really is the story with him? And I just worry <laughs> that he's had so many hard races early on. He's only been ridden one way, really. I just worry if they've kind of flattened him completely and whether he can give it all on the track anymore. And I, I hope I'm wrong because I'm, I won't back him, but I'd love to see him win a race because I have such a affinity for the horse. But And maybe it's, maybe it's because of this affinity that I'm always having these more conceptual concerns about is he still the Broadway boy of 12 months ago than I would perhaps of other horses who I'd give more excuses to. But I'd say the Broadway boy of 12 months ago who went into that December handicap would win this and I'd have no issues about him and I'd think he'd go off quite short for it. We haven't seen that horse in nearly 12 months now. I just don't know if he's this, if he has that in him because they've had to give him so many tough races. That would be my concern with him. I almost hope I'm wrong. This is devilishly tricky, this race. I've, I've, I've backed two. I backed two anti-post a while ago. Uh, the first one is Colonel Harry, uh, which I'm sure, Bully, you'll be delighted and almost saddened to hear because our record together is poor at best. But I just thought, yeah, he's, he's got everything you kind of need. I mean, this is a horse who's always been a stayer. What he was doing over two miles was kind of mystifying. He's always just been a grinder who clearly wanted the trip, never really got it, found the grade ones over two and a half miles too much, but great reappearance run. His profile just stinks of that's all right, Gino, but they always thought Colonel Harry's better than that's all right, Gino. And obviously last year's race was a lot better than this one. A lot in his favour. I think he's already drifting, which is quite interesting. I mean, he's already out to around 15 to 2 in places. So, I mean, that, I think, makes him a, a tempting each-way option. And the other one I backed a long time ago, because, again, I was over a long affinity with his can-do kid, who I am calling on in terms of I don't think he's got, probably up to winning it because his handicap mark has gone up to a stage where he was running too many honest races, I think, to win a race like this. Loves <laughs> Newbury. Uh, and he is an admirable horse who barely runs a bad race. The only time he did, he was actually up three miles, and that was really strange because nothing really got into the race, and he just stopped. But other than that, he's ultra consistent, improving. I think he'll be ridden fairly patiently. I can see him staying onto into a place. Uh, but those are the two positions I've already got on the race. If I was going to back another one now, I would back Colonel Harry at 15-2, to two, but not a race I have an overly strong view on. And if Broadway Boy wins, I'll be happy, but he'll be doing it without my money. Yeah, and uh, Jay make a, a, a very good argument, I have to say, for Broadway Boy. Uh, do you know what, Dan, I salute you. Welcome to the Colonel Harry Club. I'm very happy to have you. <laughs> uh, oh, jeez. Fingers crossed. Now, let's, let's come on. Let's, let's do this. 
Let's do this thing. <laughs> um, okay. Excellent, that was. Coral Gold Cup, done and dusted. Let's move on to the 335. Uh, it's the Coral Pip to the Post and Win Handicap Chase, Class 2, two miles, half a furlong. Imperial Saints, who was like my best bets on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, who did actually win at Aintree, won pretty easily, uh, eventually went off 6-5 to five on, so... You know, it wasn't exactly a stroke of genius for me, but he still won. Um, so that was good. Uh, it's quite a good race. Petit on air, Etalon, Isardere, Bo Balco, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Dan, come straight back to you for this uh, final race on Saturday at Newbury. I mean, I'm surprised Imperial Saint is as short as he is. Like, he went up £10 winning that race at Aintree, and it was a really bad race. Like, I mean, he won it as, as easily as he wanted to, but it was, for the for the standard... Very, very poor, I thought. Petit Tonnet obviously gets a big swing at the weights with him. He's second favourite. The horse just doesn't want to win. <laughs> he's, he's never wanted to win for three years, it seems. Uh, so he does make some of those look more interesting. Um, I'm actually kind of looking at this now. I mean, initially I had Etalon down as one I, I like, and I do still like him. I give him all the excuses in the world he needs for uh, for recent runs. Obviously, he ran in the uh, Exeter when the ground was too quick. Jump fine, just seemed to tire. You put in the leaps of the four out and three out. It looked like a tired horse. I think it improved massively for that. Obviously, you look at some of his Newbury form. He beat Martator in his chase debut when Martator's off 117. Clearly, Martator's improved leaps and bounds since then. But I think he's a horse who really appreciates a big galloping track like Newbury because I think eventually it'll stay two and a half miles, no problem. He did so over hurdles anyway. Uh, so I think at him, at, I think it was around seven, eight to one. I thought that was a fair each way price. I think you also have to be very interested in the Isair Dairy with course and distance form with Martator form. I think both of those make a lot of each way appeal, both around that seven to one mark currently. I think they'd be the standouts in this race by a mile and Imperial Saints kind of making the market for them. Oh, man, I'm so with you on Isair Dairy. I have to say, I think he's got a huge chance back in Newbury. Uh, conditions absolutely fine for him. I think he still looks nicely handicapped, to be honest. And although I've got a bit of a soft spot for Imperial Saint, and he just keeps on proving. I mean, this is a much tougher race, and the handicapper is going to catch up at some stage. And I think against the likes of his said diary, he might just be up against it. Uh, <clears throat> Jake, what do you think about the race? Well, we finally got our podcast now. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, no, Issa Dairy is, is the one I've landed on here. Um, you know, like we said about the favourite, he's gone up £10 for a race that also completely fell in his lap, but there was two massive front runners that day who went off like a scolded cat the whole way around and he just absolutely tanked into it as easy as you like <laughs> went on to score without having to really do anything so to go up 10 pounds for that and to, to go into a, a, a nice class two race like this in a hand you know open handicap next time i think that is a pretty tough ask and i'll definitely be taking one at that five to two nine to four type price um like dan i had this dairy and Esalon written down initially i think it's the dairy's kind of taken over me uh, for me now as the main bet obviously He's beaten Martator as well, who's now rated 151. Um, and he's, he was also second behind Martador, obviously, last time at Ascot, where I, he was running during a time where I think Gary Moore's horses were all needing the run. And he, he ran a belter in second that day. Obviously, Martador's won, bolted up since. <clears throat> and I think a lot of Gary Moore's are you know, like coming on for that first run. So if he comes on for that first run like like they have, he's got a great chance. Obviously, he's a dual course and distance winner as well. So we know that he, he handles Newbury. And I think another thing that put me off him at Ascot was the fact that I thought he was a, a horse who wanted about, you know, soft ground. He gets that here. Obviously, he ran a belter on the good ground anyway. But uh, yeah, now he's got the soft ground, the run under his belt. I think he's got a great chance off a mark of 130. Looking forward to seeing how all the action unfolds in Newbury and, of course, Newcastle as well. So we're going to go to there now uh, for the fighting fifth. It's the 210 on Saturday. Uh, obviously, no Constitution Hill, but Sergino is there against Mystical Power. Uh, Brentford Hope and Lump Sum... And a couple of others, including tell her the name. One of mine wants to follow for the season, and I'm really glad they've put him into a grade one. Welcome to the Handicappers in Graded Company Club. It's a sad, sad club. Although, on the plus side, if he runs badly, you can say wrong race. If he runs well, he'll go up £20, and you've actually landed a well handicapped horse. So, either way, you're fine. <laughs> go on then, Jake. What do, what do you think about the race itself? Oh, it's a good race. We've got nine runners in a, in a fighting fifth. I don't know when the last time that happened was, but uh, that, that's good to see. But it's a good, good clash, obviously, at the top. We've got Sergino, Mystical Power. Mystical Power is obviously my horse to forget for the season. Now, I, I didn't really <laughs> have him down as running here against Sergino on, on my on my bingo card when I was think, thinking out, you know, how the campaign might go for him. But uh, I am, to be fair, all over Sergino. I think that he, he is a top-class horse. Obviously, if you look back at the form of his last two races, he won the, the Triumph Trial beating Burdett Road, who's since won a Greatwood. And then he beat Kyle G's uh, uh, Aintree, and, and she's a filly who was already a grade one winner. 
and then also went on to win a grade one subsequent at Punchestown as well. So all his form is there to see. He needs to brush up his jumping a bit. Obviously, sometimes he can clatter through them, but he's he's been scoring over fences. So you'd imagine that he'd be a bit big, if anything. Um, so I, I'd hope that he, his hurdle is a lot better this time. And yeah, I think I think he's the, 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 the top class angle, like the potential superstar. I think Mystical Power could be a very good horse, but I think Serginio has that superstar, um, you know, thing about him so yeah so Gina would be the one for me but it's not really a betting race when you've got five to four and 13 to eight the top two uh, it'll, be, it'll be you know a race to enjoy yeah and I, I don't think you can yeah get involved financially at least I wouldn't for this but I do think that Sergino is going to win easily actually I think I think he'll just I think he'll just stamp his class I think he's absolutely superb um I didn't think he was massively impressive at entry last season, but at the same time, he still beat a very good filly and beat her easily. And really, he was only asked to do a little bit of work after, what, the last 100 yards or so. I just think he's proper top class. I love the way that when he was asked in his interview after the gallops at Newbury, straight afterwards, and he Henderson was asked, um, you know, he was, Sergino was upsides there, and, you know, what do you think about that? And the first reaction was that Nicky said, well, Sergino is just a very, very good horse. And we don't know what the situation was with the weights and stuff. But, I mean, he, so far he's done everything right, nothing wrong. The way he beat Bedette Road at Cheltenham last year was an absolute joke. I mean, it was extraordinary. And I can't wait to see him flung into grade one company so far. My only slight concern with him is that experience-wise, he hasn't had much of it over hurdles so far. I mean, this is going to be his first run in grade one company open and he's only had three starts in England. So that would be my, my my one slight doubt about him. But at the same time, I think he's going to be good enough to to get over it. I wouldn't be at all surprised. And, you know, you can mark this one down and use it for later date to laugh at. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if he does end up being almost, if not as good as Constitution Hill in the future. I think he's that good, but we'll see. Um, Dan, what do, you, what do you make of the race? Uh, last time we had nine runners, by the way, was 2006, in case anyone was wondering. Uh, so it's it's been a while. <laughs> I think we've only had a couple of runnings in the meantime where there were eight. So it's a, a rarity to have a field size this big. I guess that's the effect of not having a constitutional in here. People are more willing to take their chance and just give it a go. And fair play, that's good. It's it. I mean, there aren't, it, you'd say a lot of these are struggling big time, but they're not absolute no-hopers. They're nice horses behind in their own right. But it's not the kind of race I bet in. I think it's well documented here. We like our handicaps here. We like decent prices. And so I'm not really going to have a bet in the race, but I'd be with Sergino like you guys are, and I don't need to add much more, but last year's juveniles are clearly exceptional. You do not get four-year-old crops win Galway hurdles. You do not get four-year-old crops also win Great Woods. You don't get Carla Conti coming out and winning deep handicaps in usual years. They're clearly exceptional. And I think the quality is only getting better the more these French horses are coming over and they're getting more yeah. long-term prospects coming over. It's not like they're all 90-rated flat horses. They used to be coming over and they're struggling in open company because of course they are. I don't think it's the same case anymore. So I wouldn't have that really as a negative. Obviously, say one beat car gives it entries. You say he made two terrible mistakes at three out and two out. And jumping may be the slight concern. Obviously, he was terrible on his British debut as well, but ability got, got him through that. If he jumps well, I think he'll win this quite convincingly. A really nice horse. And again, this hasn't come out of nowhere. He had the reputation coming over from France when he beat Salvatore Mundi. Everyone was speaking about him beforehand. All he did was back it up that season. He's a proper horse. But let's go on to the 320. It's the rehearsal handicap chase. Love this race. I actually always have done. Always love it when a, a horse carries a big weight uh, and wins in this race. What were long press series. We've seen it before with others. Uh, Marble Sands got top weight this time, following up that Colin Parker victory at Carlisle last time. Very good horse. There's no doubt about that. Um, I'll start off very quickly with my thoughts. I think the favourite will probably win. Uh, the changing man, I think he's really solid. He's going very well in the Badger Beers last time when he fell. Uh, ground looks perfect. The, the Tizard team are in tremendous form. They've really started the season well. Second start after a wind up. I'm hoping he can make amends here. I think the test can be really suitable for him. Uh, Jake, what do you make of the race? Yeah, I'd be in agreement. It's a shame to see that so much money has already come for the changing man. He, he, was, he, he opened back up at 7-1, to one, um, which was a very fair price. Obviously, he's into fives now, which is still fair. As you said, in the Badger Beers, he was, he was my pick there. And he, he didn't do anything wrong to suggest that I shouldn't be with him again on, on a different occasion. Um, obviously, he, he was the one that was closest of all to um, Al Dancer. Should there have been any any falter, he would have been the, the, you know, the closest there to, to, to try and capitalise on that. And unfortunately, he obviously took a tumble. Um, didn't seem too bad. Obviously, he's back out again now. This looks like another winnable race. He's got his ground 
yeah, I'll, I'm happy to go to the world one more time as I was at Wincanton because, you know, he didn't get his full run that day. So I'll, I'll let him have a have a full run. We'll see where we end up with him. But off a mark of 130, as I've made the case before, he's very well handicapped. Good stuff. The changing man. Uh, us men don't really change, do we? We're just uh, back every week for the jump show, enjoying ourselves. But that's how it should be. Dan, what do you reckon? <laughs> what do you reckon? I mean, the front three in the market don't do much winning over fences, do they? Lord above. You've got Val de Great, who's one at the 13 for 10. You've got Donny Boy, who's not from eight, and the changing man, who's not from six. And they're the front three in a handicap. So if, if any of them, I, I would give the changing man a, a chance, I, but I'm not going to back him. I, but I can perfectly see why. Uh, on that note, happy retirement to Al Dancer, we have to say. Obviously, yeah. what a way to go out. I mean, and to paraphrase J.B. Carragher, leave the racing before the racing leaves you. And he's certainly done that. Obviously, unfortunately, picked up that knock afterwards, but what a servant he's been down the years. And a horse just really was transcended years and disciplines and everything. and was always top class. So great to see him get out of the game and have, hopefully has a great long retirement. But the fact that those front three in the market don't have a exactly a great winning tendency made me look further down the market. I'm going to give some scope a chance here at 25 to 1 because I think that's too big to immediately dismiss him. Now, he was terrible at Cheltenham, but I think there are reasons for that. Firstly, the ride he was given was very strange. There's, he wasn't even held up. He was just almost immediately detached and like never given really any confidence at all at his fences. Jump poorly. I think maybe flatter tracks may suit him. Obviously, he's done a lot of winning at likes of Doncaster, so maybe there's that. He's also had wind surgery since. I do recall seeing somewhere that they found a couple of issues with him afterwards. So hopefully the wind surgery has kind of got him over that. Richard Hobson's runners tend to improve for the run as well. And he did go off 13 to two for that. Let's not forget. So, I mean, this is a horse on a steep upward curve, I'd say before that. Back down to a mark 125 now. Same mark as when he was second in the Grimthorpe in really attritional conditions. Only two finished, obviously, him and does he know. But I think he's a, a horse who wants better ground. He's by telescope. All, they've always said his better ground's going to be in his favour. He's £2 lower when he was a fourth at Cheltenham, but I do just think maybe flatter tracks are more his thing. But he's not the best jumper in the world. I think maybe jumping with undulations maybe essentiates how bad his jumping can be at times. But I think with the run behind him, he was very progressive prior to, to that run last time out. 25-1, to 1, I think, is too big. Richard Hobson's runners generally improve. And you look at his record at Newcastle, 18 runners, five wins, five have placed. I think 25-1 to 1 is quite... It's just way too big, in my opinion. Uh, right, we'll move on then to the, the final segment, which is the uh, Saturday, Sunday rest of cards. Uh, Jake, anything else appealed to you over the two days? Yeah, I've just got a couple this week. Obviously, there's not as many meetings and not as much good action, but I fought in the 1240 at Newbury, uh, the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Memorial Chase. I thought Twin Jets had a good chance. Um, now, I actually quite like inch house as a horse and obviously he won this last year but the vibes about him are that he's going to need the run here and to be fair if you look back at his record he always seems to need his first run as well so inch house is one that i'll be keeping an eye on going forward but twin jets he should have won the last day there's no getting around it <laughs> um he traveled there got there and then obviously masaccio just managed to battle on pie on the flat um but I, if, if he can come on for that run he just is a well handicapped horse that can win a race like this. Like two six around Newbury on a flat track, left handed is kind of everything that he needs. So I will give him one more chance. Um, in the one twenty at Ferry House, it's the maiden hurdle. Now Henry Bromhead has his youngsters in absolute flying form. He won both the maiden hurdles at Punchestown last weekend. He also won the three year old maiden. He won the one at uh, Tipperary for, and Turles the, the, the days before that as well. He's winning absolutely everything with his young horses. And in here, he's got a horse called Semeski who went and won his bumper very well at the back end of last season. Um, he looks like the, the pick of the yard. And I, I, I'd, I'd fancy him in, in a race where, obviously, you're going to have the JP horse in favour. Um, a dream to share is finally going to go over hurdles. I, ca I can't wait to see him get beaten. But uh, yeah, I think Zemeski <laughs> will be a, a nice each way price just purely for the fact that uh, a dream to share is going to be odds on. So I'll take a chance on him. Uh, the 155 at Ferry House is the the, the grade three for four-year-olds. And it's not really a bet unless he's a massive price, but Anza Dam's in here for Willie Mullins, and I think he's just a very, very interesting horse. He was one of these triumphed um, hurdle horses that were talked up for last season, never got out in the end, so they've kept him, obviously, for this year. Perhaps he'll just have one of those middling four-year-old seasons, you know, where they don't do a lot, but if, if he is tuned up, ready to go first time out, then I, I, I could see him being a very good horse, so I'll definitely be keeping an eye on him and the prices. Um, but that's your free, and hopefully we have a good weekend.
Yeah, absolutely, Jade. Good stuff, mate. Uh, some nice uh, arguments put forward there. Yeah, Amsterdam, not seen 411 days, but could be very smart. Go on, Dan. Rest of Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, just one. It comes in the Peter O'Sullivan that Jake mentioned. I've only just seen the prices, and I'm very happy to see that Demna has opened up at eight to one. I think that is a brilliant price here. Like, very lightly raced through, and obviously we know, almost cliche at this stage, Venetia Williams is late November. She's in form. Who would have thought it? But this horse was ultra impressive on his first start for the yard, first chase start for them at Ludlow. It wasn't a deep race, but he absolutely bolted up. One by 15 left on Mark 122. And that was over an intermediate trip. Very strangely campaigned thereafter. He ran over two miles here on bottomless ground on his next start. That didn't work. Then he went to the Kim Muir. Uh, go watch that Kim Muir back. He is absolutely tanking along, and they jump three out. He's in the lead, and he just does not stay three mile two on testing ground. He shaped far better than the bare result there. I think he showed the effects of a hard race at Aintree thereafter where he never really got involved. But he's now down to a mark 127, only five pounds higher than when he bolted up by 15 lengths at Ludlow. They said he's better going left-handed. I think he wants softer ground as well. I think this is absolutely perfect for him. And as I say, the yard are absolutely flying. So I think at eight to one, he is a very strong fancy of mine for the weekend. And then just a, a race to watch, a bit, a bit like last week, and a horse I've got my eye on and have always have. People who watch this show for a while will know. Uh, the opening novice chase at Fairy House looks a good race, and Waterford Whispers is in there making his chase debut. Now, let's just say I don't think he's going to be winning that. I think all of his season is going to be geared around the novice handicap chase at Cheltenham now. I'd, I'd say they'll quite happily pot around. He's still... In my eye, a horse with a lot of upside. Obviously, ran brilliantly in the Martin Pipe. Always looked like a chaser. Just keep an eye on him. I'd say if there, I haven't seen any betting for that novice handicap yet because I think there's still some unknowns about it. But when the betting opens, I will be straight to Waterford Whispers to see what price he is. Lovely stuff, guys. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to go with one actually, uh, the same race that Jake mentioned that Grade Three uh, four-year-old hurdle. Um, I, I quite like uh, Bottler's secret to bounce back, to be honest. I, I, he's much better than he showed at Cheltenham. I think he might have needed that run. And I'd be hoping that he can fulfil the potential of his first couple of starts. Indeed, his third start uh, last season. So, uh, Bottler's secret for me is just to bounce back around about 7-2. to two. All right, lads, good stuff. Thanks very much. That was great fun, wasn't it? Always is. Um, please do remember to like and comment. 150 likes would be great. And we'd love to hear what you have to think about um, any of the races, really, Saturday, Sunday, your best bets. Uh, in particular, the Coral Gold Cup. How good do you think Sergino is, perhaps? And how much are you looking forward to seeing Matata against Matata? Anything like that, we'd love to hear. <laughs> Um, so, so do get in touch uh, until next week it's going to be Tingle Creek preview next week can't believe that's already come around at the start of December but it's certainly cold enough until then see you later <laughs>